Lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, the United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Was the man born blind because of the sin of his parents? Because often Jewish theologians of biblical times gave two reasons for birth defects, prenatal, and if a woman, pregnant woman worshipped in a heathen temple, the fetus committed idolatry as well. Yes, there were certain kinds of maladies, particularly congenital maladies, or something related to reproduction that was seen as a curse in ancient Hebrew culture based on <clears throat> certain things in the Torah that were often misconstrued or misinterpreted by people popularly and by the religious leaders. One of which was honor thy father and mother. We've explained this before. It has to do with, in Greek, the word kavod, honor uh, in Hebrew is kavod. In Greek, it's honorarium, to do with money, that you are financially responsible for the welfare of your parents in old age, the same as they were responsible for you in your pediatric years. You're responsible for them should the need arise in geriatric years. Otherwise, don't expect much longevity yourself. A commandment with a promise. Um, so not having children meant you would not have a retirement pension to look after you in old age. Now this was wed to something called Yerusha. Yerusha, again, the inheritance, the land was the Lord's. He distributed it through the apportionment of Joshua to the tribes and families he wished. A Jew could not lose their land permanently, or the family could not lose the land permanently, because it was the Lord's given to them by the Lord. In the year of Jubilee, if they lost the land through debt, it would have to be repatriated at the Shana HaYover, the year of Jubilee. You needed a Yerusha, an inheritance. Also, to keep the Yerusha and the family was important, but in certain tribes, like the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Judah, the identification of the rightful Davidic king and the identification of the rightful Aaronic high priest depended on Yerusha. So you were able actually to procreate children on behalf of a dead brother to keep the Yerusha in place, to be sure there'd be somebody to take after the widow in her old age and to perpetuate the family inheritance. It was a big deal if somebody had some reproductive incapacity. It was a big deal. You remember the saga of Rachel, give me children or I die. It was seen as a divine curse. There's no Yerusha, I, there is no retirement provision. Likewise, if a male was emasculated, um, crushed genitals, things like this, he was excluded from the household of worship. He could not perpetuate the Yerusha. Now, obviously, that has a figurative meaning. We're born to reproduce, we're born again to reproduce. People who cannot lead others or will not lead others to Christ of some incapacity. Uh, there's a figurative meaning to it, but it's again, focused on the Yerusha. Another malady that was seen is leprosy. If you were ostracized from the community, long before people knew of microbiology and virology and infectious disease, God certainly knew what was contagious and what wasn't. Hence, the Levitical priests carried out medical inspections and public health inspections, and they segregated people suffering from leprosy from the rest of the community. None of these diseases will I put upon you. So leprosy excluded you from the community of worship, as did a reproductive incapacity, be it infertility or some kind of emasculation. Um, well, let's go even beyond that now into the blindness. In the ancient Near East, literacy was generally, be it cuneiform, be it hieroglyphics, whatever alphabet, the reserve of the royalty, nobility, military commanders, and pagan priesthoods. It was not for the average person. Among the Hebrews, however, it was different. The Levites <clears throat> had to be certain that every Jew could read and write and was numerate to practice their faith. Hence, the inability to read the Torah would exclude one from the house of worship. So when this boy was born blind, the assumption was there was sin. 
either by him or by his parents. There was later rabbinic traditions that if a woman went into some malfeasance during gestation, that there would be a co-equal guilt upon the fetus. Now that's very, very interesting because it does show, however misguided it may be theologically, that the ancient Hebrews understood that life began before birth, that life began with conception, it began before birth. They had that consciousness. So this is the background of it. Who sinned, him or his parents? Now, there are passages that make it clear that illness may be the direct result of some specific sin. We see this in the epistle of James. We see it in Psalm 32. We see it in John chapter 5 with the paralytic at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus says, go your way, sin no more. He had some kind of dystrophy that may have been related to what we would call a sexually transmitted disease. We can't be sure. Those were the ways of thinking. Another case of someone being ostracized from the community of faith was <clears throat> lo tohor, ritual impurity of a female with a persistent menstrual flow. Those who've looked at the pericope with a medical eye have deduced that it is likely the woman who had the continuous bleeding, vaginal bleeding, suffered a form of endometriosis. She would have been ritually unclean and excluded from the congregation of worship. She couldn't go into the temple because she could defile other people much the way somebody with leprosy would ritually defile them. She would defile them. And by touching Jesus, touching this rabbi, she defiled him. So he took our diseases. That's what it's illustrating. It's illustrating the fact that God put our infirmities upon him. Healing is in the atonement, but ultimately that's fully recognized only in the resurrection. We may get temporal foretaste of it, as that dear woman did when she was healed after 12 years. Again, a persistent menstrual flow, uh, emasculation, um, <clears throat> blindness, <clears throat> leprosy. All of these maladies would have been associated with sin in the thinking of the ancient Hebrews, even though they may not have always understood it. So while we have passages that do relate a specific illness to a specific sin, there are other passages that make it clear that may not be the case. John 9 is one of them. John 9 tells us that it was not because of sin that this young man was born blind. It was not because of the specific sin, but that God may be glorified. We have examples of that today. One would be the testimony of, of Joni Erickson. The, the, the American uh, in, in the wheelchair. Um, she believes that God is glorified in her handicap. That's why the Lord has chosen not to heal her yet. Now, she will, of course, be healed in the resurrection, or possibly before, but certainly in the resurrection. Illnesses may or may not be caused by sin. May or may not be. That's the first and most important teaching of John. We cannot say that all illnesses are due to a specific sin, even though illness or infirmity itself came into the world as a result of the homodosphere, the fall of man. Not every illness, specifically, or every birth defect is caused by a specific sin by any means. That is the first and most important thing we need to observe from John chapter 9. An illness may or may not be the result of a specific sin, and in this case it was not. Again, understanding the importance that Hebrews put, the ancient Hebrews put on, on birth defects. He was born blind. Secondly, it is a typological illustration of the nature of fallen man. When we are born again, we see the light. When the Hebrews read the Torah, Paul says, there's a veil in front of their eyes. They're blind. You have a word play in the Hebrew language for the words for the ones who've crossed over. The Evrim, the Hebrews, that's what it means. And the Evrim, the ones who are blind, you have a word play. The Hebrews are the ones who crossed over the Jordan, but they're also the ones who are blind. They crossed over the water coming out of Egypt, but it's almost spelled the same and almost pronounced the same. Evrim, Evrim, almost the same. Um, <clears throat> The blindness of this young man represents the blindness of the human condition. We are all blind until we see Jesus. 
We are all lame until we walk in the spirit. We are all deaf until we hear his voice and he calls us to salvation. The healing miracles of Jesus always illustrate salvation in some way. People are deaf spiritually, blind spiritually, and lame spiritually. Now when the dimension of sin comes into it, it becomes expanded. We've explained this before. Going back to John 5 at the Pool of Bethesda, one of the most important New Testament passages in understanding the ministry of healing correctly. The man was confined to a pallet, a wooden pallet, but Jesus tells him to pick up his pallet and sin no more. Why did he need to keep the pallet? If the Lord heals somebody from polio, they don't need a wheelchair or crutches anymore. Why does Jesus say get back in the wheelchair? Well, it was the piece of wood to which his flesh was confined. What Jesus was saying to him in Jewish metaphor was, pick up your cross and follow me. Sin no more. Crucify the old nature. There is an entire theology to the healing miracles of Jesus, and most of the so-called healing ministries today are ignorant of them. Um, they don't understand what the scripture actually says about healing. So, we have this young man, and he was born blind. He could not read the Torah, therefore he could not worship in the temple or participate in the festivals. He could not worship in the synagogue because he couldn't read the word of God. He could not have his turn, he could not be bar mitzvah, none of those things. Now when his parents say he is of age, ask him for yourself. That's interesting. That shows you he was getting bar mitzvah age. He was getting to be the age of bar mitzvah, the same age Jesus would have been when he went to the temple. That is the corridor between boyhood and manhood in Hebraic thought. Well, let's continue looking at this now even further. They don't recognize him. Some were saying, it's not him. Others saying, oh, it is him. Oh, no, it's somebody who just looks like him. When somebody meets Christ, when somebody meets the Lord Jesus, people who knew you before you were saved, people who knew you before you were born again, are confused. That's not him. That's not her. Jacob Prash was a cocaine addict and a drug dealer and a communist. That's not him. That's not her. She was immoral. She used to sleep around. She used to do this. That. It looks like her, but it's not her. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. The wind blows where it wills. They don't get it, what the Spirit of God does. Don't expect unsaved people who knew us before we were Christians to understand what has happened to us. They just don't get it. This is one of the reasons it becomes so difficult to witness to relatives. When you're in a situation and you meet someone you never met, they're going to accept you for what you are, a Christian. But people in family who knew you before you were a Christian, it can become much more difficult. They're always going to relate to you for who you were. They just don't get it. This is another very important aspect of John chapter 9. Finally, a final aspect of John chapter 9 is this one. He was ostracized from the community. He was put out. So first he was ostracized from the community of worship because he was blind. But then he became ostracized because he could see. <laughs> this poor kid couldn't win. He was first ostracized from the community because he was blind. But then he was ostracized after he met Jesus and he could see. But the text tells us, Jesus found him. There are people in Islam. There are people saved out of uh, Judaism. In certain countries, even Roman Catholicism in Latin America. They're unbequeathed. They're disinherited. They're rejected by the family and the community for their faith. They're ostracized. But Jesus always finds them. If somebody is rejected for the sake of Jesus, he will always find them personally. He comes looking for them personally. And he finds them. John 9 is a very rich and a very deep chapter. And it goes on from John 9 into chapter 10. Bearing in mind there's no chapter division in the Greek text. <clears throat> it's coming up to the Feast of Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication of the Temple. It is the Jewish Feast of Light and Miracles. Hanukkah, Neska Dor Hayapo. Jewish Feast of Light and the Jewish Feast of Miracles that Jesus was going to celebrate in John chapter 10. But chapter 9 sets the stage for it. 
the incredible miracle of healing, but also the light, being able to see now. Now let's understand this even deeper. There were certain things called messianic miracles that the ancient Hebrews believed only the Messiah could do. They were the reserve of the Messiah. Raising someone from the dead was ironically not one of them because that happened in the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. It was not that. But making a blind person see was something they thought only the Messiah would be able to do. Even today, we know from modern medical science that if you have necrosis of the optical nerve, the optical nerve is dead, medically that person is never going to see again. They believed only the Messiah could make a blind person see. By Jesus healing this person, it was emblematic of his Messiahship. It was a testimony of his Messiahship. It was a statement to the Jews. He's making a statement, not just by what he says, but by what he does. They knew only the Messiah could do this. That is why the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin were so completely overtaken and freaked out by what happened. And they kept interrogating the young man over and over. And he says, I was blind, but now I see. You don't want to become his disciple too, do you? He begins taunting them about it, not realizing it was the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Quite a passage, quite an incredible passage. Not all illness comes from a specific sin. Psalm 32, James 5, etc. tells us it may or it may not. This is a case where it was not. What is important is when someone has a handicap, or if someone is born with a handicap, with a congenital birth defect, and I speak here as someone who is presently handicapped, if the Lord allows that for the believer, the Lord will find a way to be glorified in it. If he chooses not to heal that brother or sister in this life, God has a purpose in it. He has a purpose in it, that he will be glorified, and that believer will be used of him and ultimately blessed. But don't worry. He took our infirmities. If he doesn't heal you now, he's going to heal you at the rapture or the resurrection. Your healing is absolutely on the way, so don't fret. In the meantime, glorify God and let him be glorified through you despite your handicap. But be open, be open, both to God using medical science where possible, and do not think that God cannot at the proper time, his time, intervene supernaturally and bring about a supernatural healing where medical science cannot. We must always allow for those possibilities. But by absolute faith and assurance, we can say healing is in the atonement recognized at the rapture or the resurrection. This is the background of John chapter 9. Every one of those aspects is important. The Yerusha, the wrong presuppositions about sin being responsible for a malady or a birth defect, the rejection by the community because of being blind, but then the rejection because of being able to see. <clears throat> Society is more accepting of those who are blind to Christ than those who can see him. The fallen world is more accepting of those who are blind than those who can see. You're going to be rejected but then the Lord is going to find you. Also, the fact of his age, that was important. He's of age, he was a bar mitzvah age, but he could not have been bar mitzvah because he couldn't read the Torah. Quite a thing, quite a rich and spectacular pericope of the Gospels that goes on to set the stage for what follows in John chapter 10. Hanukkah, the Feast of Dedication, the Jewish Feast of Light and Miracles. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.